Well, we're going to need God's help to understand these words, for they are truly multidimensional and complex. So let's see if I can help us navigate these deep waters. What this isn't is a simple prophecy. Historically, on a one level, one could call it that. But what does that have to do with you and me? And don't you know that there are many people today with the gift of foreseeing the future? Maybe somebody here has a bit of that gift. So the fact that Jesus has the gift of knowing what is going to happen to that temple is the least important thing in this teaching. How about that? But we're going to start with the least important and find our way into the deep places that have to do with our lives right now. As I've told you so often, it cannot be Holy Scripture if it's just history or something unrelated to right here right now. So Jesus and his simple folk from Galilee are looking at this magnificent second temple of Solomon. 46 years in the making, it has another 30 years to go to be built. One of the amazing things about it is that there are plaques of gold along the side. Can you picture the desert sun hitting those plaques of gold, what an incredible sight. Who wouldn't think that this was sacred and holy? And indeed, they believe from thousands of years back that in the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go, where the Ark of the Covenant could be found, that was the residence of the Holy One. So when Jesus speaks those shocking words, that not one stone will be left upon another, there's another message to be had besides foretelling the future. He's right about the future. Do you know after those 30 more years of building, this glorious edifice only lives on for seven years before the Romans completely destroy it. And you might recall, I've told you before, the gold melted and got caught in the Stones and the soldiers against their general's orders tore the stones down to get to the gold so there's nothing left but that wailing wall we've all seen on television of that mighty structure. So you could say, well, Jesus was right. But of course, he is speaking about something much more profound. He is telling us that this temple of stone and gold is glorious edifice 15 stories high does not contain God. There's no end to how radical Jesus is. He is going against thousands of years of a certain kind of religion. He is introducing to us a new, radically new quantum leap into another kind of experience. For you see, it doesn't matter if the temple is torn down because as you may know already, we are told that the true temple of the Holy One is you. There's no need for stones and gold and all of that. Jesus is bringing us into an intimate link with the I Am of creation. Unlike anything that has been spoken of before, no wonder they crucified him. That was just too rank. But the disciples being just like us, what are they going to do? First of all, not understand what he's talking about. And they're going to say, when? When is this happening? This prophecy you're giving to us that other prophets have given before. When is it going to happen? When is the end coming? For well, this is clearly an apocalyptic saying and we here in our day have a certain obsession with apocalyptic things, don't you think? How many movies are being made about apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic life? It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
Our younger generations are playing computer games about post-apocalyptic life on this earth. My advice to you is, remember that it's fiction. Just like the Left Behind series that so many people bought is in the fiction section of the bookstore. Jesus is teaching us something, so his answer to when will this happen is beware. Now, that's a strange answer, isn't it? Beware lest you are led astray. In Greek, it means lest you wander from the truth. So that the question of when makes us wander from the truth. So all that is assumed by uh, more literal theology is wandering from the truth. It's right there in his words. He says nation will rise against nation, earthquakes and all of that, but it will still not be the end. The first question to you is when did nation not rise against nation? When was there no famine in this world? When has it ever been peaceful and wonderful on this planet? Never! Jesus is focusing not on what is going to happen, but how we respond to the catastrophes of life. Now we're getting home, aren't we? Your catastrophe of life. You're facing unemployment. You're facing divorce betrayal, everything else. Life is full of catastrophes. We don't need apocalyptic, cosmic things to happen, to be in despair and dread. And he is teaching us how to deal with it, how to make it through life in peace and faith. That's a whole other story, isn't it? That's no longer first century, that right now. So he could have answered when they say, when will it happen? Right now. It's happening right now. And our instructions are given to us in this teaching. And the very word apocalyptic simply means unveiling unveiling the truth of God's protection. And so as we go through this, you must understand that he is using metaphors and strange words to speak for all time. He points out that in all this catastrophe that happens, when the end does not yet come, we will have the opportunity to witness. Isn't that wonderful? When you're in pain, when you're in misery, when you're hopeless, you get the opportunity to witness. And by witness, I don't mean handing out tracts about Jesus. What we are dealing with here is how do we live in peace in the midst of storms? That's the witness. How do we manage to not be anxious when every normal person would be anxious? when you have every reason to be anxious. When awful things happen, like being hated by parents and relatives and friends, who here has not been hurt or betrayed by a friend? Is anybody here who doesn't know that feeling? It's horrible. It's reality. It's what happens on this earth. And he tells us when this happens, don't worry about how to react because Holy Spirit will speak for you if you remember that you are the temple of God. If you turn within to that which will inspire you. In other words, if your strength is not only yours, but God's strength coming through you. They tear down the temple, they ruin everything, they reject all your efforts, they betray you, but you can still stand and count on Holy Spirit to help you through that which seems impossible. 
This is no fairy tale. In fact, he goes on to say, you will be hated because of my name. Not because we're Bible thumpers and talking about Jesus. Because of my name means a certain way of living. Can you picture what that is? A certain way of being good, compassionate. The way. That alone will get you in trouble. Isn't that crazy? But it's the truth, don't you know it? Your effort to do the right thing will get you in trouble. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. It's a wake-up call. And he says some will even be put to death. And then he tells us, just in case you're wondering, this is too nuts, it gets even crazier. But not a hair of your head will perish. Now you tell me, how do you get tortured and taken in front of judges and killed and not a hair on your head will be hurt? Obviously this is leaping into a spiritual metaphor. In other words, your deeper self, your true self, your soul cannot be overcome by the enemy, by the darkness, no matter what happens, if you let yourself be that temple of God. In other words, surrender to God's presence and protection. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it is, your soul will awaken to the goodness of God. This is what he's saying. And finally, in those words, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. Let me try to get rational here for a minute so that people don't get too dizzy over all this. What is endurance? Here's the dictionary version. The ability to do something difficult for a long time. The ability to deal with pain and suffering that continues for a long time. The ability to sustain prolonged, stressful effort or activity. Another translation. By your steadfastness and patient endurance, you shall win the true life of your soul. Remember the teaching of Joel. Those who endure to the end will be delivered. We are told in no uncertain terms that no matter what happens to you in this life, no matter how many bad luck, horrible things come your way, it is possible to make it through to the end and stay whole inside, not be broken, not be turned bitter and hateful, but live in that beauty of God's presence. Who dares to let go and let God? Who dares to surrender to the reality of God in such a way, no matter how difficult things are? That's what we're being taught because that's the answer to the uncertainties of life, to the fragilities of life. And he says again and again, do not fear. Earthquakes, do not fear. Nation against nation, do not fear. Relatives hating you, do not fear. Why? Because fear, we all know fear, is the opposite of faith. So when you feel that fear, you turn the other way and go for the faith. That's what Jesus is teaching us. Don't let that fear overwhelm you. Turn to that which is other than fear, which is faith in the Holy One, and all will be well.